Hello everyone, welcome to Star Psych, and today I want to talk about Carl Jung's visual interpretation of the mind in relation to cognitive functions and the idea or concept of having two auxiliary functions instead of a auxiliary function and a tertiary function. Let's get into it. I've talked about this image many times before on the channel, but I really wanted to go a little bit deeper into the idea of having two auxiliary functions today and what I think, you know, Carl Jung was meaning by that as opposed to maybe how Briggs interpreted it and how we interpret it today. As you can see in the image and even in the description, he describes a dominant function, a dominant process, and then there's a repressed function down at the bottom. But when you look at the auxiliary functions, which are described as auxiliary functions, as in multiple of them, you can see that both of them occupy a side space and that they're not like rank ordered like how we would typically think about it when we talk about MBTI today. You know, we look at an INTJ and we have NITE, then FI, then SE. And I think the way that Carl Jung actually was more so presenting it was that we have a dominant function, which is then, you know, followed by two auxiliary functions, which is then followed by a repressed function in terms of preference for how we interact with and how we value these functions. Essentially, your dominant process is going to be very present, very conscious. Then you're going to have these two auxiliary functions, which kind of teeter-totter into consciousness, in and out of consciousness, based on maybe where you are, the mood you're in, your development, these sorts of things. And then you're going to have this repressed function, which is not really anywhere near consciousness or not very likely to peek its head into consciousness unless it's through some sort of uh, stress state. I have my own illustration that I did of this concept a year or so ago where I talked about the idea that I think this is why I use a four function model as opposed to an eight function model and that I think it's better to observe the functions as four variables that have two ends of a spectrum associated with them as opposed to eight discrete categories. And when you look at the image that I will put on screen here of my illustration of my interpretation of this, you can see that I think that the dominant and repressed functions kind of stay entirely in one side of the psyche. So if you're an INTJ, for example, and you have introverted intuition as your dominant function, it stays entirely in the conscious attitude of introversion, whereas your repressed function stays entirely in the unconscious attitude of extroversion. But the interesting thing is that when you look at the two auxiliary functions, the two center functions, both of them might show some qualities of being in the other attitude because of the fluctuation that they have in consciousness. But they're each going to show a strong preference towards one side of it. So when looking at the INTJ, you can see that extroverted thinking is going to show a much higher preference for what would be unconsciousness actually in the INTJ because extroversion is unconscious in the introverted dominant types. An introverted feeling would show a strong preference for consciousness introversion in the INTJ. That's another thing that it's important to recognize when you're talking about MBTI types, Jungian types, and the idea of consciousness is that your tertiary function is actually more of a conscious function than your auxiliary function. Does that mean you use it more? No, because it's still an auxiliary function, just like your secondary function. And I actually still prefer to call what is now the auxiliary function still the auxiliary function because of the idea that you get a better complete picture of an individual's psyche when you see the number one function that represents their inner world and the number one function that represents their outer world, which is why we discuss things in terms of one, two, three, four. Because if you're an INTJ, Introverted intuition is how you interact with the inner world. Extroverted thinking is how you interact with the outer world. Therefore, we get a good enough picture of what a person with those preferences is likely to act like or how they're likely to value things when interacting with their inner world and outer world first and foremost. That said, I do think that people undervalue not the strength, but the value of the tertiary function in that it is actually a secondary auxiliary function. It is going to be supporting the dominant function just as much as the auxiliary function at times, especially if it's something that doesn't require someone to step out into the unconscious side of their psyche. If you're an extroverted type and you're engaging in a heavily extroverted activity, why are you going to tap into the auxiliary function that is in the introverted realm? You're less likely to. 
But if you are an extroverted type and then you're engaging in some sort of activity that requires you to go into introversion, then you would use that auxiliary function to support your dominant function. Just as if you're an introverted type, if you engage in an activity that's going to be introverted, you're more likely to use your tertiary function as opposed to auxiliary function because it's going to be the lens that best accommodates the situation that you're currently in. You know, if you then engage in an activity that requires you to go into the outside world, you know, you have to engage in extroverted thinking of some kind if you're an INTJ, then you'll use extroverted thinking. Well, not use, but you'll see things through the lens of extroverted thinking when necessary, because that's the tool, that's the lens that is available for you when you are interacting with the outer world. So the key takeaway from this concept, from this video, is that your tertiary function isn't actually as low in your psyche as you might originally interpret. And that's why we often hear people talking about, oh, it's just an INFJ with strong TI, or oh, it's just an INFJ with strong FI, or oh, it's just an ESTP with strong FE. It's because that tertiary function is actually pretty valuable in the psyche. In fact, I would argue that it's even more valuable to you as an individual than your auxiliary function in terms of your values and what is actually important to you. I, I say it's not uncommon for me as an INTJ to choose an FI value or decision over something that is TE practical if I'm in a situation where I don't think it's going to matter that much. You know, the example I like to use is, for example, when I'm playing video games, I tend to pick the characters that I relate to or enjoy more than the ones that are actually going to win the game unless I feel some strong need, desire, or urge to win in that moment, in which case I will absolutely pick the thing that is the best. But I would say a large majority of the time I'll pick the thing that is just more representative of what I think is interesting in a character. And that is something that I think you can see across the types when you look at their dominant and tertiary function is that that tertiary function is going to be very present, just as much uh, present as the auxiliary function when they are making decisions that don't require them to use the unconscious side of their psyche. So that's my hot take today on MBTI types and functions is that I think that the tertiary function is actually a secondary auxiliary function as Jung described. And I think it's actually important to kind of recognize this if you want to understand how Jung was interpreting the psyche. Now, we're just talking about MBTI, we're just talking about Jung, we're not talking about all the different models, I'm strictly talking about how Jung was interpreting the psyche, which is what I currently think to be the most congruent model when it comes to personality typology, that's why I follow it. I don't feel like I've seen a model that could challenge it well enough to make me step away from Jung's interpretation just quite yet. I think that the potential is out there in the future for people to surpass what Jung was thinking, but I just, I haven't seen it quite yet. Young was quite extraordinary. Anyway, that's besides the point. So two auxiliary functions, try to think about that when you're thinking about personality type and even typing other people. You know, think of those center two functions as relatively balanced and that there might even be a preference for the tertiary function at times because it's in the conscious attitude as opposed to the auxiliary function, which is in the unconscious attitude. Hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know down in the comment section what you think. I would like to remind people that I do have personality typing sessions available as well as coaching at my website, asursite.com, if you're interested in working with me to find out what your personality type is and what that means for you. This has been Asura from Asursite. Have a good one.